Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a couple of questions. Does Israel need the U.S. to force it to stop the war in Gaza? And why isn't the U.S. doing anything to end it? Let's get to the bottom line. For almost half a year, Israel has argued that it wants total victory in Gaza, although no one knows exactly what that looks like. So every day that Israel tries to achieve its victory, hundreds more Palestinians are killed, maimed, or buried under rubble with no end in sight, whether in the Gaza Strip or the West Bank. Meanwhile, the United States and its allies continue to supply weapons without conditions, ensuring there is no permanent ceasefire. At the same time, the U.S. has submitted a draft resolution to the U.N. Security Council that calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza that's tied to the release of hostages held by Hamas. So what's the end game for the U.S. in the Middle East? Where does Washington want the conflict to really go? And what risks are posed by President Joe Biden's strategy? Today, we're talking with University of Pennsylvania political scientist Ian Lustig, author of several books on the Palestine-Israel conflict, most recently Paradigm Lost, From Two-State Solution to One-State Reality. And in Ramallah, Dr. Mustafa Barghouti, founder of the Palestinian National Initiative. Let me start with you, Ian. Thank you so much for joining us. Look, you've been writing a little bit that we've danced this dance many, many times, that we've seen conflicts between Israel and Palestine, uh, and there was an agent that was involved in bringing this to close. Tell us what the history of conflict has required in the past to end it, and what's happening now. You're asking about the war. How come this war has been going on for months and months without the United States stopping it. Every other Israeli war, starting even as far back as 1948, uh, was stopped by great power intervention, After starting in 56, by American intervention, after a very short time, a couple weeks, a couple months or, or so. <clears throat> Why this time is it taking so long? What is important to note is that none of Israel's wars end because its war aims are achieved. That's because the war aims are fundamentally political, and the military cannot achieve them, but the government can't admit that, so it needs the outside world, specifically the United States, to stop the war. The United States has not turned on the red light this time. In every other conflict, it's taken a, a couple weeks or a month for the United States to do that. That's why this war has gone on as long as it has, and it will end when the United States turns on the red light. And it won't end until then. So, Mustafa, you know, I find this to be an interesting moment where if you look at the past, and you and I have talked about this many times, one of the most cliched, overused frames made by presidents and secretaries of state in the past is that we in America can't want peace more than they do. Is that really the case? Don't we need to want peace more than the, the players in this conflict? No, no, no. I absolutely disagree with that. I think it's just one way from the side of American uh, officials to run away from their responsibility. Mm. Uh, but there are a few corrections to make here about what was said. First of all, uh, I don't like the word conflict. Mm. It, uh, it, uh, it tries to present the situation as if it's two sides who are equally guilty fighting over a piece of land, and uh, they don't know how to stop this fight. It's not true. This is a, a struggle of people who are under occupation, people who have been oppressed since 1948 with the worst form of ethnic cleansing, forcing 70% of them to become refugees. It's a struggle of people against a settler colonial project, which was initiated by Israel and took away people's land, oppressed them, made them refugees, and now continues to kill them. The Israeli establishment, and that includes not only Netanyahu, but also Labid and Gantz and all the Israeli opposition, they don't want to give any part of Palestine to Palestinians. They want all of the land for themselves, and they don't accept two-state solution, and they don't accept one-state solution, which would be a one democratic state. So what is their solution? exactly what they are trying to do now in Gaza, which is ethnic cleansing. Mm -hmm. That is the reality of the situation today. The United States of America has been supportive of Israel. It made some verbal uh, protests against Israeli settlements, but did nothing to stop settlements building, which 
killed the possibility of two-state solution and created a new political power in Israel, a fascist power, headed by Smotrich and Ben Gvir, who are now controlling the Israeli government. You have more than 31,000 people dead, 100,000 people injured, infrastructure wiped out. I mean, I'm just sort of sitting here and watching this play out. And I'm also watching a president of the United States, Joe Biden, possibly laying out the framework for losing the next race because of antipathy inside the United States about these actions or the lack of action by the, by the president. So would love to get your thoughts in response to Dr. Barghouti. Well, there, I agree with so much of what uh, Dr. Barghouti has just uh, said, but I think that uh, the listeners should understand two large things and I, uh, two points that I want to make. One is that there's that, uh, yes, Israel is certainly a creation of settler colonialism. It is a settler colony. Uh, just like, uh, but that's true of so many countries in the world, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Mo uh, Bolivia, uh, Argentina, Australia, Canada. The, the fact that uh, a state comes into existence because of settler colonialism is not that unusual. And usually what happens is that the indigenous populations are annihilated hmm. or rendered politically insignificant because of demographics. But in this case, it's a very unusual case in which the indigenous population, the Palestinian Arabs, were not annihilated. They were uh, cleansed, 750,000 expelled from their homes in 1948, even more in 1967. But still, there are masses of Palestinians still in Palestine. In fact, there are more Palestinian Arabs between the river and the sea than there are Jews right now. Hmm. So that means that you have a powerful state that ideologically saw itself the way these other states have seen themselves. But unlike the United States, which does not face 300 million uh, Native Americans inside and outside its borders, uh, Israel still faces the, the indigenous population that the settler state was set up to displace or dominate. So, that's, so remember that that's what makes this such an unusual situation. It's both a conflict and an example of settler colonialism and resistance. Well, and I, the, second, the second point I, I want to make is... Uh, but United maybe States. here uh, the United States is supporting Israel because it sees itself in Israel. But I, the difference think, is that we are, I, we are in the 21st century. And it, uh, there is something called international law and United Nations and all of the rest. So the yes, annihilation it, it that took place law, in, in Canada and the United States does not justify the one here. In any I am way. not justifying I mean, anything. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Absolutely. In no, just to clarify. Law, well, Dr. Lustig? Yes. I just wanted to finish that second point, that the United yes. States, I think you're right, in the 1950s, uh, there was a kind of naive identification of pioneers, with of uh, a pioneering ethos in the United States, the Oklahoma kind of ethos with uh, Chalutzim in Israel. But that is past. The United States is not motivated by exodus kinds of images. What motivates American politicians, and it's true of almost every president uh, in recent times, is a desire to get this issue off their back, because politically it's so dangerous to get on the wrong side of the issue. It's, the, it's like Cuba, the only two issues in the United States be, that are driven, foreign policy issues driven by domestic political imperatives, which leads America to have a, a, a policy three or four standard deviations from the rest of the world. So the United States, uh, when it makes decisions about what to do with the Middle East, with this conflict, it, as a great power, it, it responds to domestic political constraints. It doesn't care very much or even know very much. It doesn't care very much, let's say, about what's good for Palestinians or good for Israelis. It's in the bottom line, what's good politically, what's safe for us. And in that context, American presidents have engaged in peace processes, but not gone the distance necessary to put the pressure on Israel to get the kind of compromise that could have worked. Mustafa Barghouti, you're a very good analyst of posturing versus substance, in my view, when it comes to this conflict. And I'd love to get your take on the change language, uh, the resolution possibility, the interactions with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and Joe Biden, what do you take seriously and what do you find promising and what do you find completely a charade? 
Well, uh, before responding to that, we have to agree about one very specific point, which is that the United States of America cannot be a mediator in this conflict, if you call it conflict, in this struggle, let's say. Why? Because the United States of America is absolutely and totally supportive of Israel. It's an ally, ally of Israel. Actually, the United States of America in this last war has not been only complicit with the Israeli war crimes. It has become participant in the war crimes, not only by supplying Israel with 28,000 tons of explosives and weapons, etc., but also by sending, by sending 2,000 soldiers to Israel and by sending their uh, advisors uh, to the Israelis to help them in uh, urban warfare, and by uh, participating even in the war uh, cabinet of Israel. The president participated, the foreign minister participated five or six times, the national security advisor, the defense minister uh, or secretary of defense, they all participated. So the United States is, is, is deep involved in this war crime that is happening in Gaza. And now there is a huge exposure of these war crimes, the genocide, the collective punishment, the starvation of the people, uh, killing people with diseases, with, with, with famine. It's so clear. So from, from that perspective, I think the United States is facing huge criticism worldwide, but also inside the United States. I think there is a huge a young American generation that does not accept what Mr. Biden is doing, and he is losing elections because of that. Uh, the, there is also the whole Arab Muslim community in the United States who have become gradually a political voting power, and that is going to affect the chances of Biden. So he's trying to adjust. But on the other hand, they try to adjust, but they continue to do the, the bad things. For instance, their resolution that they were going to present at the Security Council has just changed. Instead of saying, calling for a ceasefire, now they say, the new language says, it is imperative to have a ceasefire. There's, that's very big difference from calling for a true ceasefire. If the United States was really serious, they could force Israel immediately to have a ceasefire. They could tell Israel, we will withhold all kinds of military supplies to you. They could tell Israel, we will stop the finan financing your war. They could tell Israel, we'll start sanctions if you don't stop settlement activities. But they're not going to do any of that. That is the problem. And, and that is the reality. But in the face of the world change, the, world, the whole world is changing. There is a whole world revolution against this aggression on the Palestinian people, against these war crimes that nobody can tolerate. And there is a change inside the United States. And what makes me really very especially, especially uh, proud of the change is that even the young Jewish community is changing. And many of the young Jewish activists are demonstrating in support of Palestine and in support of justice. We live That's in the cool. 21st century. It's not, it's not the 12th century or the 10th century. And that's why I think what we see here is a struggle not only about Palestinian rights, but about the principle of civilization, the principle of the right of people to live according to international law and not the law of jungle which Israel is imposing. Right. Um, I, very, go ahead, Ian Lustig. Yeah, it's very important to note that, yes, it's correct, there is a split in the Jewish community in the United States. There has been for a long time, but it's accelerating. And as was just said, the younger generation of Jews especially, uh, fired by liberal values, is outraged by what's going on, disgusted by what Israel and American foreign policy has done. I think what I understand, inside the administration, there's also a struggle going on, and that ultimately, when the United States turns on the red light, and I agree completely that it has the capacity to do that, it will be the result of who wins in the battle inside the administration to try to convince Biden that his old way of dealing with Israel is got to completely change. It is changing, but not very fast. And it's that battle inside the administration and inside the Democratic Party that seems like it will be decisive to decide when the war ends. So, Ian, uh, Ian Lustig, when does the red light come on? If you look at young voters in this country, uh, in many key states, and particularly Michigan, Minnesota, others, they're, they're saying they do not like uh, what President Biden's foreign policy is, his, his close proximity uh, to Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu in this conflict, 
and you, you see this coming on, and you see now 100 major Democratic donors sent a letter to President Biden and saying, you've got to change course or you may lose this election. So I mean, it, it, it's rare. i got to tell people, it's rare that a foreign policy issue matters in a U.S. presidential election. It's usually kitchen table economics. But this is the first time where you're actually seeing the black community, some parts of the black community, also become ambivalent about uh, the, the president right now because they see this conflict as a social justice issue, which reflects on them as well. So I'm just wondering, when does the red light, from your experience and looking at the history of these, shouldn't the red light have already come on? I guess that's my yeah. bottom line question. Absolutely. I mean, not only shouldn't it have come on from a moral point of view, from a foreign policy point of view, but it should have even come on from the domestic political interests of President Biden. And, and what usually does trigger that red light is a judgment that the domestic political situation allows uh, that light to go on, either because uh, you can justify going against the Israel lobby because you don't want a, a confrontation with the Soviet Union or with another great power, uh, some kind of Cuban missile crisis, or because of the humanitarian catastrophe. What it seems to me is that President Biden on this issue is a slow learner. And he is learning, and I think that the uh, issues you point out, the pressures inside the Democratic Party, the threat to his reelection uh, probability or possibilities, that will be the determining factor. That will turn him uh, toward switching on the red light. Uh, and that, by the way, is a metaphor that is used for almost the end of almost every one of Israel's wars, if you look at the scholarly literature on how these wars end. Dr. Bargudi, I'd love to get from you the temperature inside Palestine, the West Bank, the uh, ruling coalition there. You have for years basically miraculously kept your independence politically from the various factions, but you comment on them. We recently saw on March 15th Fatah issuing a condemnation of Hamas for being responsible essentially for the destruction of Gaza as opposed to looking at, at Israel for the destruction of Gaza. What's going on among the factions? And what prospect is there for any sort of consensus on really the future of Palestinian governance in this after this equation is in dealing with things now and tomorrow? I know that you say we can't just talk about tomorrow. People are dying today. And I get that. But I just want to know, as you look at the equation that's coming together, are you seeing players actually creating an impossibility of a consensus coming together? Well, that's a great question, and actually it relates to the United States as well. But uh, let me explain. Uh, we just had a very good meeting in Moscow, uh, where I myself, for, uh, for the tenth time, mediated between Hamas and Fatah and drafted the communique, which everybody agreed about, all the 14 Palestinian political forces. We had a very good communique, which said that uh, all parties have to enter PLO, and we have a unified Palestinian leadership there. Uh, maintaining the right of the Palestinian people to represent themselves. And uh, we agreed about the goals, uh, the end of the war, the humanitarian assistance, preventing any kind of expulsion of the Palestinian population and uh, ethnic cleansing, and uh, caring about issues of Jerusalem and so on. And we agreed to continue the meetings, to proceed. Unfortunately, the president went on and appointed a prime minister without any consultation with any of the Palestinian political groups, which created a new, a, a new rift. The statement you mentioned by Fatah, which uh, in my opinion was uh, inappropriate, uh, uh, was negated by some of the members of the Central Committee of Fatah. We were told, they, they called us and told us that this communique does not represent Fatah completely. And that uh, many members of the Central Committee of Fatah, which is the highest organ there, do not agree with it. And uh, that leads me to the issue of the United States, because you see, the United States is pressuring for what they call reforming the Palestinian Authority, and by the or revitalization of the Palestinian Authority. And by that, they mean only resecuritizing the Palestinian Authority, making it more of a security structure that serves Israel's interest. And that lies behind the statement of Mr. Biden when he said, President Biden, when he said that any Palestinian authority or government has to be acceptable to Israel. He wouldn't say that any government in Israel should be acceptable to Palestinians, of course. So the American approach to revitalization is only about security. And that raises the question, 
Why in every other country, whether you talk about Serbia, Ukraine, Russia, China, or any other country, the United States speaks about democracy, about democratic elections, the right of the people to choose democratically and freely their leaders, except in Palestine. They are opposing our elections, opposing a real democratic reform, which would make the Palestinian Authority acceptable by the Palestinian people before it is accepted by Israel. And that's the, the, the issue we are talking about here. What we want is a national consensus government accepted by everybody that is interim so that it would prepare for free democratic elections, which allows Palestinians to choose their leaders freely and democratically like other democratic countries. That's what we need, real democratic structure that represents the Palestinian people and their aspiration. But Israel is adamantly against democracy. United States, unfortunately, was against our right for having free democratic elections. And that's where we see another negative aspect of the American right. policy. What an interesting inflection point that would be. Dr. Lustig, I'm going to give you the last word. But in this, I also want to ask you, you said something that has been hanging in my mind during this show, which is you talked about the Israel-Palestine, you know, uh, peace industry, if you will, the... the <coughs> You know, the, the peace this, process this, industry. Yeah, the peace <laughs> process industry. I've always been interested in what would finally put that peace process industry out of business and, and get to us a, a, a new equilibrium along the lines of what uh, Mustafa just talked about. But as you give us the last word, I'd love to hear what you, what you think is needed for that industry. To a process instead something. of the solution. Yeah. By yeah, the way, a yeah, process industry, is instead of the solution. That industry is focused on the idea of a negotiated settlement between two sides, as if there's a, the West Bank and Gaza are outside of Israel. But Israel has already absorbed, really treated the West Bank and Gaza as part of the country. And that's why it's important to remember that President Biden's official policy is that the United States is committed to, an, to the Palestinians and Israelis having equal rights to equality, dignity, democracy, and security. And that, if the two-state solution can't be achieved through negotiations, which it cannot be, we have to return to the theme of equality and to the gradual democratization of the one state that exists between the river and the sea. And that is a project that the peace process industry doesn't really, can't, can't make money out of. They can't make money out of the idea that if we don't uh, uh, have negotiations soon, uh, it'll be too late, it'll be too late, it'll be too late, which they've been saying for 40 years. Right. What we have to do, see is, is a long struggle over democracy. Right. And the United States has to reorient itself in that way, seeing this as a domestic issue. And, uh, and that will be good right. for Palestinians because they can get equal rights and sumu right. and be able to stay in the country. Well, regrettably, I need to leave it there. I'd love I to have agree. a half hour more with both of you. Uh, great conversation. Professor Ian Lustig, professor of Middle Eastern politics at the University of Pennsylvania, and my friend Dr. Mustafa Barghouti, founder of the Palestinian Thank National you, Initiative. Thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. So what's the bottom line? Whenever the topic of Palestinians and Israelis comes up, American officials love to say, oh, well, we can't want peace more than they do. Oh, really? I, for one, don't buy this cliché. There are serious reasons why Palestine and Israel may never come to terms with each other in a stable and eventually a peaceful way. But that's exactly why third parties are essential to buffer between them, to act when there are injustices to victims on either side. One of those key parties is the United States, whether it likes it or not. The U.S. needs to demand peace more than Israel and Hamas want to have peace. It has to demand justice and show genuine concern for both sides of the conflict. And because that's not happening, the war machine just goes on. That's why there's no peace in the Middle East. And that's the bottom line.